Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. This is the Conservation is Not Neutral, Emotion and Bias in our Work webinar. This is the third and final webinar in the series on social justice and conservation. I'm Sarah Satron, the Education Manager for the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation. This program is organized by the FAIC and volunteers from AIC's Equity and Inclusion Committee and the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network. Thank you again for being here. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the Zoom platform before turning it over to the moderators. So you should be able to see the moderators and the panelists on your screen, as well as the title slide. To turn on the captions, find the closed caption button on the bottom of the screen and click the small arrow, then select show subtitles. We appreciate all of the questions that were submitted before the webinar and, a welcome, and welcome additional questions throughout the session today. You can ask your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and typing your question there. Your question will be sent straight to the moderators and they'll address as many questions as possible. You can also use the chat box to share your comments and experiences with the other participants throughout the session. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email when the recording is available. I'll now turn it over to the moderators, Anita Day and Lestarsha McGarity. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Anita Day and I'm a third year graduate student at Buffalo State's Garmin Art Conservation Department. And I'm also the graduate paper intern at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. Currently, I serve on the Equity and Inclusion Committee at Buffalo State and the Washington Conservation Guild's Idea Action Committee. I also own Agents to Fight Deterioration, a small business that sells art conservation related goods that create visibility to the field and spreads awareness on how neutrality in conservation contributes to inequality in the field. Hi, I'm Lestarsha McGarity. I am currently the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the National Gallery of Art where my research focuses on African-American assemblage art in the gallery's collection. I also serve on the Buffalo Alumni Board and am active with the Black Art Conservators. The recent protests of racial injustice in America have led to conversations on how museums and those who work in them historically dictate whose stories are told and what materials are valued through their preservation. Conservators as an agent of preservation are often at the crux of these issues. Traditional models of conservation have taught us to attempt to maintain scientific objectivity at all times. But in reality, what has historically been called objectivity is actually just the continuation of majority perspective, which was enshrined as objective fact by scientific theories that went hand in hand with colonial subjugation of non-white people. As conservators, we work within the ecosystem of cultural heritage to aid in the preservation of history, holding firm to the idea of objectivity and emotional separation from our interventions on objects. As museums begin to acknowledge their role in upholding colonial perspectives, conservators are also re-examining their role. In contrast to the traditional objective model of conservation, Conservators are now questioning the elimination of emotion and bias at our benches. It may not be possible or preferable for conservators to eliminate feelings from their handling of emotionally significant artifacts, even when those artifacts do not emotionally resonate with them personally. This session will explore the principles of neutrality in conservation and discuss how biases contribute to inequality in our field with our three panelists, Dr. John Till Robinson, Jamal Sheets, and Latanya Autry. Thank you for that introduction, Anita. I am uh, thrilled to start us off with Dr. John Till Robinson, who is a pioneering art historian and curator who received her doctoral degree in art history from the University of Maryland, 
and was the first curator for both the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art in Atlanta and Tuskegee University's Legacy Museum at the Tuskegee Institute uh, National Historic Site. She curated slash co-authored for the Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts contribution to the 1996 Olympics, Bearing Witness, Contemporary Works by African-American Women Artists, the first exhibition of African-American Women Artists Touring America. In 2016, Dr. Robinson conceptualized the Alliance of HBCU Museums and Galleries, which is a coalition of 11 historically black colleges and university museums and galleries. The Alliance has partnered with Yale University, Princeton University, the Winterthur University of Delaware Program in Conservation, the Garmin Art Conservation Department at Buffalo State College, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and Shelley Payne Conservation LLC to create a new pipeline for HBC, HBCU students considering museum and conservation careers. Dr. Robinson may have to leave the panel slightly early to accommodate another commitment. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A early. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank you all um, so much for this uh, opportunity this, this afternoon to be a part of this panel. And um, before I start, I want to thank Caitlin Richardson again for asking me to uh, participate and uh, Sarah Satron for her work in organizing all of this. And um, I wanted to take a moment to congratulate Lestarsha McGarity on being admitted to the PhD program in conservation at the University of Delaware Winter Tour. And I want to congratulate Jamal Sheets my fellow panelist. Uh, he is a fellow at the Center for Curatorial Leadership. The success of both these individuals strike at the heart of African Americans in major positions in the art world. And we are so proud of Jamal and Lestarsha. Those of you who know my legendary persistence should also understand how racists and bigots can thwart your progress, but they cannot stop it. A dream cannot be stopped. Approximately 27 years ago, I was curator of the Spelman Art Collection. In 1988, a gift was made to build an art museum from the ground up at Spelman College. I came to Spelman in 1989 and stayed until 1999. I received early tenure. Three of us, Lev Mills, artist, Dr. Akua McDaniels, art historian, and I worked on what should be included in the museum. The builder for the museum was Herman Russell, a black man. The firm that worked on the museum design and interior was white. Lev Akua and I met several times with an individual from the firm tasked with the interior design and preparation for the building being created. I had taken an introductory course directed studies in art conservation in graduate school. So I knew I wanted a mini conservation lab in this new museum. I had the foresight to ask for a conservation lab several times on the premise that it was a new building, there was money, and you ask for as much as you can get going in. I asked for the equipment and a basic conservation lab. I asked innumerable, time, innumerable times. The response of this white man who was working with us on museum design and interior said, we did not need an art conservation lab. In other words, what did a black women's college need with an art conservation lab? In fact, we needed it desperately. His only nod to my request 
was to put a sink in museum storage. He and I stopped speaking long before the project ended. He hated me and I knew he did. He made no pretense about it. He hated that I even knew what a conservation lab was. And WTF was I doing asking for one. Art conservators, this is emotion and bias in your work. But by asking, according to Toni Morrison and Ibram Kendi, I had escaped the white gaze. When internalized by black people, the white gaze functions as a pair of glasses binding our eyes and thereby our very being. To see the world through the white gaze, no matter what one's identity is to center white people and their looks, their ways, their perspectives and their actions. The white gaze positions white people as the perpetual main characters of black life and thought. It colonizes imaginations. It becomes hard to create and without what people think and, will, and without what white people think about the creation ever present. That is an art conservation lab as a workspace at Spelman College in 1993. The white gaze situates white people as the audience and deports the rest of us as illegal aliens. Fast forward 27 years and here I am on a panel discussing conservation is not neutral, emotion, and bias in our work. The white gatekeeper for the field of art conservation that I encountered 27 years ago is no different from the conservators gatekeepers now. His admonition is the same that we hear today. You don't need that. Art conservation is not for you. You do not need to preserve your cultural heritage. There are, not, there are not enough jobs. The same person that told me no 27 years ago is the same person that sits in meetings with me today and pretends that they are interested in assisting alliance of HBCU museums and gallery students in learning art conservation, museum leadership, curatorial studies, and then pivot towards preventing the very thing they are saying publicly they want. In other words, this is bias in your work. How must this bias be counteracted? How must it be opposed? How must it be resisted, prevented, and restrained? I would like to show you some resistance. For MLK Day, 2021, DBG, the downtown boxing gym, partnered with Class Ag Detroit and, tar and Target to host a thought-provoking, inspiring event that had students creating their own unique beats and rhymes and painting original works of art with a civil rights theme. Shout out to Rashad Dobbins, who is the founder of Class Act Detroit. Rashad is a friend of my daughter's, Prejean, and I am going to talk to these students about art conservation and especially time-based media art conservation at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, and the courageous support of Michelle Marincola for Alliance Programming. We raised the sparks of revolution. We're focused on MLK, even really representing what he's been for. He managed to build a better nation, not by himself, but with an entire group of people. If you're ready for change. Put your fists up in the sky. If you're ready for change, let's go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, everybody. It's Mr. D. And Ms. Carter. From class at Detroit. For MLK Day this year, we held a virtual event where the kids basically got to choose have different the is not seeing them. to be themselves, but also allowing them to have a voice. 
showing them that you can use music to send messages and to create change. What did you guys think about, you know, changes that Martin Luther King made in the world? He better improved our nation's, like, you know, equality. I would say he changed our nation but for the better. He sparked conversations that most people were afraid to even have or even talk about. It basically helped shape our world today, but it also helped us to continue the fight that we're fighting today. One of our workshops included them being able to create a beat. So far we have, I have a dream for justice for all. I have a dream for services for all. Move the spark to the whole world. Move the spark to move the whole world. And then you can kind of move into some more. We had another workshop where the students were able to paint and express themselves through paint. Please hold it up. Let us see what's on your mind. What I hope that the students took from this event, they are the future, but they're really the now. The scholars are the now. Give yourself a round of applause. You are the revolution. We love you. Good night. Peace. Peace. Hi, Dr. Robinson. We can't see your screen. You couldn't see that. Oh, my goodness. You missed all of that. Oh, God. Would you like to share your screen again? We can try it out one more time. Okay, I apologize. Let's see. Also, there's a link if this video is on a web page, we can put the link in the chat and let people watch it on their own as well, if you'd prefer to do that. Right. Oh, I'm so sad that they didn't see that. Oh, there you are. Okay. So you'll let me know when I put something else up, whether or not you can see it. So the, did they hear, they could hear it though. Okay. So the Conservation Center at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York, one of four graduate programs in art conservation in the country relies on grants from funding agencies and individuals to run its program and, and support its students. As part of a recent grant from, grant from the Mellon Foundation to the Conservation Center of the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University agreed to create educational videos that illustrate aspects of art and artifact conservation on conservation science. New York University share is under $30,000 and the work is to be completed before summer 2022. Professor Michelle Marincola will coordinate the video production at IFA NYU, which is to be created by students and faculty as part of a classroom, as part of classroom assignments and conservation um, with colleagues from outside New York University who will be among their ideal audience. Members of the Alliance of HBCU Museums and Galleries will advise IFA NYU on useful topics and approaches and perhaps identify HBCU students who would like to take part in the video production. IFA NYU will acknowledge each participant by name and role as well as the Alliance in the credits for each video. Michelle believes the project holds potential for interesting, interesting more students from HBCU institutions in the field of conservation and even providing useful instruction for galleries and archives and collections care. It is my hope to show the students at Class Act Detroit, and I'm so sorry you didn't see the video, but you heard it, and our 12 HBCUs, Michelle's videos, including Spelman College. Therefore, the entire process that I encountered at Spelman has not only completely turned around 27 years later, but it has taken on a sense of urgency, majesty, and magnificence. And it is now more expansive. 27 years later, I have survived. And Jock Reynolds, former the director, formerly the director of the Yale University Art Gallery, and Ian McClure, director of a Summer Teachers Institute in Technical Art History at Yale, University IPCH invited me to a Summer Teachers Institute in Technical Art History. This long held passion ignited once more with this 
invitation. The same day that the opportunity was offered, I applied. The Yale University Art Gallery and IPCH opened up to the Alliance of HBCU Museums and Galleries and our students. What we have been able to do in five years is nothing short of miraculous. I first met Michelle Marincola at the Stitcher at Yale in 2016, and that is how all of this has unfolded. Patrick Ravines, Director of, Con of the Conservation Department at Buffalo State, and Professors Emily Hamilton and Gabriel Dunn, and the student Katia Zinsley. And um, originally, Lestarsha McGarity, who is now the moderator for this panel and has uh, graduated from uh, Buffalo State, they assisted in conserving two dioramas from the 1940 Negro Exposition in Chicago. And I just want to show you a brief clip of Lestarsha. Uh, conserving one of the dioramas and you all let me know if you can see this on the screen. So I think you have to hit share screen first before we can see it. Oh God, what happened? At the bottom. Okay. My name is Lestarsh McGarity, and I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas. able to get interested in conservation at my undergraduate Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas, where I was able to be involved in preserving some of our murals on campus, and that started me on the path towards conservation. I worked on a diorama entitled the Surveying of Washington, D.C. by Benjamin Banneker, and it was made in surveyed the lands that became Washington, D.C., and is most well known for creating a series of almanacs. It also features Andrew Ellicott and Isaac Brakes, as well as two men who represent the roles that enslaved men played in building most of the federal buildings prior to emancipation, with the original White House in the background. Restoration of the diorama first included photography to document the current condition of it and any changes that I made. So that way, if anything was found later to be inaccurate, it could be easily removed because there was evidence of what it was beforehand. Following photography, I performed dry surface cleaning with brushes and sponges to remove a lot of the dirt and grime that it built up, followed by aqueous cleaning, which just means that I used water to clean it 
uh, very specifically because everything is watercolor and is sensitive to water. So I first applied a layer of mineral spirits so that way I could remove the dirt without affecting the watercolor paint below. Following that, I did consolidation, which just means that the layers that were detaching from the object were put back down with the, an adhesive that's reversible. And then we... All right. And... Um... I reached out to Joyce Stoner and Debbie Hesnaris at the University of Delaware Winter Tour about the dioramas at the Legacy Museum. And we are now having conservation programs to interest students from HBCUs in art conservation at UDL Winter Tour. And an elementary school, let me just make sure I do this right. An elementary school principal saw the CBS Sunday morning feature about the dioramas being conserved at Udell Winter Tour and called me. And now Cindy Schwartz and Ann Collins Smith, director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, will assist me in talking to black elementary school students in Chicago, their parents and their teachers about museum occupations, including art conservation, museum directorships, and curatorial positions. And Cindy Schwartz, Christine McCarthy, Tara Kennedy, and Mark Aronson at the University, at Yale University Art Gallery, Yale Center for British Art, and Yale University Libraries are collaborating in a UNCF Mellon Teaching and Learning Institute specifically aimed at educating students and mentors from HBCUs about art conservation. Paul Messier at Yale's IPCH has been helpful with Alliance programming and Alliance students and we are grateful to him and everyone at IPCH. Truly this is a new day. I greet this new day with joy and zeal. My exuberant outlook brightens my world and adds brilliance to even the most biased, bigoted behavior I encounter. I see the best in each person and all situations grounded in the idea that good, good like all that I have shared with you today is in and through all things. I am jubilant and with gratitude, I am thankful to all of you who have helped. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. It's my pleasure to introduce Jamal Sheets, the director and curator of the Fisk University Galleries and Assistant Professor at Fisk University's Art Department. Since joining the galleries in 2015, he has curated 19 exhibitions, established the Fisk Museum Leadership Program, expanded and nurtured partnerships, implemented innovative programs to foster access, and engaged with the collections. Sheets is a trustee of the Frist Art Museum and is a board member on the HBCU Alliance of Museums and Galleries, Association of Academic Museum and Galleries, and the Maddox Fund. He received his MFA from Tufts University and BS in Art from Fisk University. Sheets is a member of the 14th cohort of the Center for Curatorial Leadership Fellowship. We are delighted to have Jamal here with us today. And with that, I turn it over to Jamal. Uh, thank you, Anita. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to be a part of the conversation and to be along here with my colleagues, Dr. Robinson, uh, Latanya Autry, and special thank you to Lestarsha and Sarah and Caitlin. And it's also nice to see in the chat all of the conservatives that we've worked with over the years. And so it almost feels like a, uh, a homecoming of sorts, uh, even though we're all meeting virtually. I'm gonna try to uh, attempt to share my screen. Um, uh, 
And so, can you all see it? Oh no. All right, can you all see my screen? I just wanna confirm, fantastic. And so thank you once again. And so again, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm super excited to, to kind of unpack the topic just a little bit. Um, I always like to say that I started my career as an artist. And so that's really the lens that I, I, I look through uh, as my or I approach as a director and curator of Fisk University Galleries, but also uh, as an educator as well. And so with that, I think back to my days in graduate school, where I had a professor who would always ask the question, what makes good art? And the answer to that question is always a good question makes good art. And so I wanted to use that as an analogy uh, to the statement that conservation is not neutral. That's a wonderful statement. But the question is, or what good questions would be is why is conservation not neutral? Or can conservation become neutral? Or what systems or structures prevent conservation from being neutral. Now, what's not listed in that list, but it's an undertone of the conversation that I think we're gonna to have today um, is that con conservation is also a lot about priorities. And so I'm going to discuss the topic through the lens of our collections, just a little bit. And so Fisk University Galleries was, has been a collecting, it's a, Fisk University has been a collecting institution since the 1870s. Um, the majority of our collections were built at a time where many artists of color and women were largely unrecognized or ignored. And so with that, we're known for the Alfred Stiglitz Collection of Modern Art. Uh, we actually are in the process of installing Origins of Influence Part 3. Pictured here is Origins of Influence Part 2, the title wall, the Alfred Stiglitz Collection of Modern Art. Um, for Part 3, we've dropped the subtitle and it's just origins of influence because we're broadening the narrative. We're, use, we're including African and African-American modernists to, be able to tell a better story of early, uh, early European and American modernism. But I wanted to use this as an example first to talk about kind of, this is what out of all the 40, the 4,300 works in our collection, this is what Fisk is known for. This is actually the draw. I mean, literally people are knocking down doors and clamoring to get in to see this uh, exhibition. And they're coming to see Picasso, Renoir, Cezanne, uh, and of course, George O'Keefe, who uh, donated the collection to Fisk after the, after the death of her late husband, Alfred Stieglitz, and Alfred Stieglitz himself. So this has been somewhat of the gateway to the institution and has also been one of the priorities for the institution. But we're fortunate that now we share the collection. Uh, we had a seven year legal battle. And out of that seven year legal battle, uh, we develop a partnership with Crystal Bridges. And so it, the, the collection rotates every two years. So with that, we're able to highlight other aspects of our collection. And so we have to remember that we've been a collecting institution since the 1870s, but also Aaron Douglas came to Fisk in 1930 to paint the murals. Uh, this is a piece that was uh, commissioned by Aaron Douglas, building more stately mansions in 1944. And this was housed in the International Center, which was a place that we would exhibit artwork. We also had objects from the Harmon Foundation that would, would be exhibited at Fisk from 1926 at our first annual Spring Arts Festival through, its, through the Harmon Foundation's closure in 1967. We also had uh, David Driscoll, who came to Fisk as chairman of the art department after Douglas retired in 1966, uh, and also uh, was at the helm of the, the gallery, became the director of the gallery. And during his tenure, you saw a huge influx of artists of his time coming into our collections. So the question that has become is what has sustained us? Where's those collections that, that have sustained us? So when we look back at 2019, we saw nearly 10,000 visitors. Now, Fisk is a small institution. We have about 875 students. So to see 10,000 visitors, that's quite a feat. And so with the number of visitors that have been coming in to see our exhibitions, the conversation has changed. They're no longer looking to see the Alfred Stiglitz collection. Um, oftentimes they're coming to, the, 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 they may have one expectation, but they come out leaving with a greater appreciation. And so I wanted to show images that had people just because I'm yearning for the opportunity to welcome 
uh, more people into the galleries uh, today. Now, what's pictured here is um, Terry Atkins. This was our previous exhibition, Terry Atkins, Our Sons and Daughters Ever on the Altar. Now, what you're looking at are the original plates from the book, The Souls of Black Folks. I wanted to use this as an example because the, over the years, the conversation has changed. Now, when people come into the gallery, they're saying, well, wow, do you know what you have? My first question is always, yes. Why is this here is the next question. Or they make statements about this should be somewhere else, that this should be at the Smithsonian, or this should be at this museum. It should be any other place but here. So that now these objects have become a part of the mainstream as institutions are clamoring to fill the void of artists that they did not, uh, that, that were either ignored, underrepresented, that now that they are a priority, that then the question comes up of where they belong. And so I use it also as an example, because as we think about those questions, those questions in the future can lead to uh, and I joke with this, but lead to conversations about repatriation. Now, going back to, so going back to those structures of those questions that we talked about before, you see that goes back to the structures that, that inform the way that we train, the form the way that we think about training. They also inform the way that, uh, that our, our processes are. And our process is generally aligned with our priorities. Now, again, I talk about our collection in the sense that our collection was built at a time when either, uh, it was built at a time where, when people of color and women were largely underrecognized. And then also I think about our collection because with administrations, uh, priorities are instituted. And so for, depending on the administration depends on what collections were our priority? And the Alfred Stiglitz collection was a priority for a long time. Now that's not unique to a certain extent because when you look at most museums in the United States, only 1.2% of only 1.2% of collections are of African American artists. And yeah. So it goes back to saying that. Um, that the work is relevant. Now that the work is relevant, it shouldn't be here. And so in order to address the first question is why is conservation bias? Well, the conservation is biased because of priorities and priorities get funded. Now to get back to the second question is how or why can, how can we or why isn't conservation neutral? Now this is a work we're in preparation of, we're in preparation of preparing an exhibition of African modernists, African modernists in America from 1947 to 1967, which is going to travel to several ex to several different venues. But I wanted to use this particular image as an example uh, by Akano Lashikan, Okadimbe of Elisha. Now, this particular piece, and that's my bad Yoruba with the Southern accent, but this is about uh, Okadimbe, who was a warrior, and legend has it that he was decapitated in this fight. Why is it significant is because when I think about the collection and at Fisk is that we have survived. Uh, we have survived in spite of, now what does that mean? We have survived in spite of the lack of funding. And so when you look at priorities and you look at funding, I wanna give you some data. So when you think about uh, if you were to combine all of the 100 HBCUs endowments and put them up against the top predominantly white institutions, that sum would not even broach the top 50. So what does that mean? That's just not among academic institutions that also goes along with collecting preference. And so when we talk about museums and institutions, they, and, and the way, where they spend their funding or allocate their resources to find what artists are important. So then that brings me to the next question. Oh, why funding is important, but funding also, we fund our priorities. So when I started at Fisk, we started, we started with our gallery ambassador program. Now that program consisted of students that had recently come to Fisk. The gallery had just been open. Many of them walked in the door and got the bug. And I quickly realized while they got the bug was that they came from cities like New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And they hadn't had 
access to museums in those major metropolitan cities. Fast forward, last week I was having a conversation with one of our, co uh, another colleague who's also a museum director. And I was sharing with her the data from the students that we have in our museum leadership program, or in our, not just in our museum leadership program, but our gallery ambassador program. And in that conversation, she said, as institutions, we have failed. And so as institutions, we have failed to, to put the funding in the right places to expose our young people to the opportunities within the field. Now that can be considered also a barrier, if not the barrier. And so what are we doing to help, to help uh, break those barriers is that we established the Fisk Museum Leadership Program in conjunction with the HBCU Alliance of Museums and Galleries. Now that program consists of four modules, five now. We actually added a new partner this year. Uh, the first module is conservation. The second one is collections management and registration. Uh, the next one is museum education. And then the last module is museum development. And so what we hope to do is give students a crash course into all different aspects of the museum. Now, Dr. Robinson mentioned a lot of our partners uh, through the HBCU Alliance and through the Smith and Center program. Uh, this year, we have a new partner, and that's LACMA and uh, LA County Museum of Art. And we partnered to create our collections management module, but also they did our conservation module. And we're working on a two-year fellowship to train HBCU students in the area of conservation technicians and also in collections managers. Uh, here's also another slide uh, with one of my favorite uh, conservators. And there's a bunch that Dr. Robinson had mentioned, and I've seen so many of you all in the chat. And so before I, I end, what I would want to leave you with is that, is that while, we're, while you are all conservators working at your prospective institutions, you know, as we've talked about today, it's about asking the right questions or asking different questions. And so to get the priorities funded, we have to begin to ask questions about who is not being represented, not just in terms of our collections, but in terms of our research and personnel. So what I ask of you all to do is to advocate within. And with that advocacy from within and asking those critical questions, then that can be a way that, we, that, that the field of conservation could be less biased and become and move forward to being more neutral. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Jamal. That was wonderful. And I have the pleasure of introducing our last finalist for today, last panelist for today, my apologies. Um, that is LaTanya Autry. She is a curatorial organizer and currently the Gund Curator in Residence at MOCA in Cleveland. Uh, LaTanya exercises her practice through developing exhibitions and programming in institutional spaces and various para-institutional collaborative projects, including the Social Justice and Museums Resource List, the Art of Black Descent, Museums Are Not Neutral, and the Black Liberation Center. Latanya is completing her PhD in art history at the University of Delaware and is examining the interplay of race, representation, memory, and public space in her dissertation entitled, The Crossroads of Commemoration, Lynching Landscapes in America. And with that, I'll turn it over to Latanya. Thank you um, to everybody for, well, for Caitlin for reaching out with the invitation and really to everyone here today. I'm very um, excited to be on a panel with such brilliant people. Really everybody in this group is amazing. And I've been enjoying listening to these um, really important presentations. Yeah, so um, museums are not neutral. I just wanted to talk about it a little bit since conservation is not neutral, seems like it's kind of building on um, that same energy. This is an initiative that I co-produced with uh, Mike Morawski, who's a friend of mine who works out in Oregon, also works in museums. And we kind of just put together this phrase, which I actually wear in the t-shirt, um, kind of came up with this, is a way to kind of push back against so much of the discourse in museums. And a lot of it, what I was hearing um, at the time, I actually used to work at Yale University Art Gallery, and several people there kept telling me, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, like various programming, because the museum had to be neutral. 
And I was like, there is, wait, that don't even make any sense. Um, a museum in the first place is pretty much out of a colonialist construct. Um, and it's just putting in a reductive way, people going to other countries and taking objects back and putting it on view in this kind of European model. Um, it has to do with power dynamics and everything. And also working at Yale University Art Gallery, I was like, this is obviously, I mean, any museum, but Yale, come on. I was often um, not even the only black person, but the only person of color in meetings for years that there was just no way that that was a neutral environment ever. Um, and when I left in 2017, I just was so, I was just kind of done with hearing people say that thing about neutrality in museums. I've heard it for years in multiple areas, but I had just kind of hit the ceiling with that at that point after leaving Yale. Um, so that's how the initiative started. And we had no idea that it would go on and become a big thing. And it became global because it resonated with a lot of people. And we're not really saying we you know, ever um, invented the idea of not being neutral. It's just that that was what it was. It was just making a point that more people started using the phrase to as a way to connect with one another and it became global it went on past a few months is what we originally thought this would be and it became um national but also international people all across the world have kind of latched onto the to the phrase and they use the hashtag as a way to communicate with one another and stuff and i think that's really um wonderful so i work as a curator and um I don't think of my curatorial work at all as is, is nothing about neutrality. I mean, as you know, for me, that doesn't even make any sense. Of course, it's about power dynamics. As I said, um, I've often been the only person of color, only black person, but also only person of color, and in majority black cities. Like right, right now, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and um, is a majority black city. And I work in a, a white museum space that there aren't any black people in any positions of power and haven't been for over um, half a century. It is common, it is common. I have only really worked um, mainly in white museum kind of spaces for the most part. And it is, um, you know, it's ongoing racism basically all the time, in addition to sexism and um, classism and a whole lot of other things. I wanted to sh show you some some stuff from a previous exhibition I curated here in 2019, oh, 2020. Um, it's called Temporary Spaces of Joy and Freedom. And let me pull up the presentation real quick here. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yay, okay, let me get to the beginning. So my training has mostly been, um, I've gone to universities that are predominantly white and worked mainly in predominantly white um, museums as well. And it's been interesting because I've also been using the opportunity while I've been in these museum spaces to really expand my understanding of critical race theory. So I apply critical race theory to the work of how museums operate. And so, so partly by being on the inside, it was a way to get more research and I've really learned a lot about racism and how it operates through this, this model, this way of, um, uh, of learning. And this show, Temporary Spaces of Joy and Freedom, I really feel like I kind of got to this point where I am really, um, I learned a lot, basically. I kind of came up with deciding for myself as a curator that my curatorial praxis would be centering um, black people, centering folks of color, centering of those people who are historically excluded. So when I'm creating exhibitions, I'm always trying to really be in dialogue with um, people like me, um, people from working class backgrounds and so forth. All the people that these white museums typically actually exclude on the regular. So this show is working with um, Leanne Batas Masaki Simpson's book. So she's a um, indigenous scholar, Mishi Saga Anishinaabek scholar in the area now known as Toronto, Ohio. And some of the things she says in her work, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, it really resonated with Toni Morrison, who is one of these people who, for me, is just kind of everything. You know, she's like a mentor to me. I never met her, unfortunately, but I did meet her many times through her scholarship. And this is a quote from, uh, you know, a passage. And I really, like when I read it, it, it made so much sense to me and it was so antithetical to actually my training as a curator. Like I said, having 
been trained mainly in white institutions. Um, she's basically saying, you know, what what black writers should be doing is be writing for black people. Um, stop kind of creating material that's really written for white people where we actually end up kind of um, harming ourselves, uh, doing things that are really like just violent to black people, but for the sake of building ourselves up through through white institutions, through the, um, in this case, she's talking about literature. But when I read this, I thought that, thought about this a lot, like now we can get down to the craft of writing where black people are talking to black people. In this case, I think she was actually referring to um, Ralph Ellison's book, Invisible Man. And she was talking about invisible to whom? Who was this character invisible to? Black people were seeing him, but because for him, he was the character seemed to be really focused on how white people thought about him all of the time. And so um, I think this is kind of responds in a way to um, what Dr. Gentile Robinson was talking about earlier about the white gaze when you kind of always think about white people is the normalized audience um, and which is often how many of the predominantly white institutions frame everything is that it's, they're mainly trying to reach a um, white audience and typically in art museums it's that upper middle class and affluent white audience as well. So I thought as a black curator coming from a working class background, um, that is not my audience. Those are not my people. And I always wanna be in dialogue with my people. So finding like Toni Morrison's work really um, is something I thought I'm gonna keep that in mind as a curator. I've had to find what are the things I could hold on to and bring them to my curatorial praxis. So let's see here. Okay, so I came across an article, um, this was a couple of years ago, online, it's called Temporary Spaces of Joy and Freedom, and it was a discussion bet between Leanne Batas, Masaki Simpson, and Dion Brand. I had heard of Dion Brand, she's a Caribbean, Canadian poet, scholar, educator, um, all, all around amazing, brilliant person. I didn't know Leanne, who is also all of those things, and an activist, um, she is, um, like I said, Mishi Sagat Nishnabeg, and they have this conversation and they're talking about Leanne's book as we have always done indigenous freedom through radical resistance. I read the article and it just really sunk in my head and I kept thinking, wow, this is some powerful stuff and how have I not heard of this, this person before? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not of her community, but I got a lot out of it. And she was mainly her big point, what she said is with her book, is that she wrote her book with her community, her Mishisaga Nishinaabe community in mind. She, besides for like, often she said when she's um, doing her writing, publishers, you know, white publishers probably, would tell her that she should be including like glossaries and defining all of these words and really, you know, changing the context so that white readers would be able to just get the work right away. And she was like, no, I'm writing for my community. That point, that she makes in this discussion that she's having with Dion Brand just really hit home to me about who am I creating exhibitions with and for? Who am I writing wall text for? Who am I um, you know, trying to be in dialogue with? Like, as I said, working in a predominantly white museum here in Cleveland, where it's a city that's majority black, but the people who come into the museum don't look anything you know, like the actual city. And there's reasons why, you know, why that's the case. Um, black people aren't in positions really of power and can make the exhibitions and programming for the most part where I am. So working with this book, one of the things I like that Leanne talks about too is, you know, communities working together, in particular indigenous and black communities. She's like, we should work together more in fighting white supremacy. So this is the kind of stuff where I start really like I already had these ideas about critical race theory and I've been applying them through the museum work, but um, through coming to this, finding this discussion and then doing this work, it really started to sharpen my ideas more towards an abolitionist and decolonial type of curatorial praxis. So that's what I'm trying to get at now, more of a liberatory kind of thinking, a way that's about how do we abolish white supremacy um, and how do I do that through my work as a curator, any kind of things I'm doing. And for me, curatorial work involves, of course, like programming and stuff. I don't see it as separate. You go back. So the show, this is a, was a, it was in many ways kind of a small show. Um, 
it had a featured about six artists. So this is, it was in this long kind of weird room, like a bowling alley kind of shaped room, but it worked out great in the end because I brought in this floor cloth that's by um, two artists that are part of Decolonize This Place, Moana, um, by Moana Anumatello and Kyle Goen. And we had some, <laughs> excuse me, some video here from Leanne, who is a um, singer and artists and just poet, all kinds of things. Um, this yellow wall had a text on the wall where she said, historically, it's been indigenous and black artists who have created visions of freedom. And this kind of freedom is more than just things that you think about in your head, but it's freedom, like something that's in your body. It's an embodied kind of experience. So I thought about artists that seem to resonate with, um, you know, what she's saying in the in that discussion. And then I invited a few different people to be part of this show. And um, like I said, the the red red carpet here down the center, this is a 30 foot long canvas floor cloth. It's um, by, by Moana Numatello and Kyle Goen. This area in the back here is a, um, by uh, Trisha Hersey, who is of the NAP ministry. Some of you might've heard of her. She's on Instagram and a whole lot of things and brilliant, wonderful um, thinker, basically telling us that rest is our resistance. And that is our reparations. Our rest is part of the reparations that we should be having. This is just another view of the space. You can see more of the, the video screens. Uh, one of the videos over here is uh, Leanne Batas Masaki Simpson and Kara Mumford. And the one in the back is by Leanne as well, but this time with Amanda Strong. And we had this kind of reading area in the space. I'm always trying to find ways to um, include more materials to, to help more people, you know, tap into their power. And in this case, um, it was some of the, you know, Leanne and um, Dion Brand are both writers. So I, of course, included their own books in the space, but also books for children, just other other kinds of things. Other things that were just, some of them are things that Leanne talked about in the essay. Um, some are things that I just thought related and made sense, like Audre Lorde, you know, important person, Saidia Hartman, important person. Um, just all good things up on this wall. And these are just some kind of close-ups, more of the um, content of the videos. I'm just gonna scroll through these kind of quickly. So Trisha's A Portal for Rest, where she actually invited people. This is pre-COVID, you know. Unfortunately, the show was only open for a little while. We opened it at like the very end of January and the museum was open for about a month and then we closed because of uh, COVID. Reopened for like one more month later at the year, but then closed again. So the show really only was open for like a couple of months really. And I would say, is it really did a lot though on that little bit of time? Um, it was different for people. And the way I wrote the text, I tried to write the brochure text that I was really communicating directly with um, the people that this show was for. And I thought very much about Black people here in Cleveland that are typically excluded and also Native communities. And this is another um, images of how we had some of the posters up from Trisha's IG. They became kind of um, posters that were up into the space here deprogramming. This is a work by John Edmonds, the photographer who graduated from Yale, actually, by the way. Take some more pictures of decolonize this place. <clears throat> In the essay, it was, I basically was questioning this idea about marking communities, who is the we, all of that kind of stuff. Who is the we when we talk about we in the museum and really questioning who that we is. When um, white museum folks, curators and directors say we, their we is very different than my we. And I made a point to actually really talk about that. And the we who is in really invited in the institution, a lot of times places will say like where I was, I've been, they will say, well, you know, we're doing equitable work because the museum has free admission. That doesn't make the museum equitable, actually. <laughs> and they didn't know really what these words were. A lot of times people are using a lot of words like diversity, inclusion, equity. All of this I found where I would just ask people questions about what they really meant by these words, where were they getting them from. Um, this is something I feel so proud of that I did with this show is the artists in the show, 
in temporary space and joy and freedom, for the most part, we're activists as well as artists. They are actually people who are really trying to change the world. That's not the case all the time, you know, with artists. That really was the case all with this show. And um, here, I'm over here, and uh, Leanne is um, seated, and I invited the artist. So this is Trisha Hersey right here. This is Via Moana, and this is um, Kyle Goen. I invited them to meet some other artists and cultural producers here in Cleveland and really try to build a cohort. I think this is what's so important is just, you know, finding the right people and kind of building energy with each other and creating a network where we can keep supporting our work over time. So this just kind of give you a brief idea, but yeah, I'm really excited about this thing that I'm calling, you know, a, a liberatory curatorial praxis that's um, being very careful about who I'm working with and how I'm doing that work. And I'm not really sure um, a lot of times on how to do it exactly. It wasn't really trained to do this. It's me figuring it out as I go, you know, go through the steps. Thank you. Thank you, Latonya, for that presentation. And I'd like to also thank um, Jamal Sheets and Dr. Robinson for their presentations and the discussions that they've opened up today. And with that, I'd like to remind the audience that um, they can submit their questions through the Q&A portal and we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. And then um, I'd like to discuss an image um, that's on the next slide, please. So this is myself, my co-intern and my two um, supervisors when I was working at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We were treating a Knights of the Ku Klux Klan banner. And this image is courtesy of CBS News who did a, a segment on the African American History Culture Museum before it opened. And this is the first time in conservation that I really found that a piece triggered a very strong emotional response in me. And I had to confront my bias in treating this work. And so I'd like to open the discussion with asking the panel if they have any similar experiences with an object that made them confront their bias or elicited an emotional response. I could share a little bit, I guess. Um, nobody else has anything at the moment. Um, when I was at Yale, um, I worked in the photo department as a curatorial fellow and it was interesting. So a lot of times classes would, um, a professor would reach out and ask for certain objects to be on view. I would put them like up on some kind of easel. So in temp uh, not actually like installed in the galleries, you know, this is kind of in the, um, we called it the print room or something, you know, just a space that's private for people coming in to view things. And I found it to be, so difficult when people would ask for images of Native American people because we didn't have any photographs by Native American people actually of themselves. And in particular, like with the Edward Curtis photographs and they really kind of put forward a racist narrative about the, the vanishing Indian or something. I think that's like what it's called. And um, so I'd be putting these out and it's like always this work of trying to like kind of like you putting it out and they're, they're actually visually beautiful and um, like how they're done formally, you know, the, and everything. But they're also really <laughs> hyper violent, these images. And a lot of times people don't know it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it's the case for me to figure out like how much they know um, and what they don't know and how to kind of make sure that we're kind of sharing this larger context. And at the same time, advocating for the museum to actually buy some photographs by Native American artists as well and trying to work with um, you know faculty on, on at the university as well. I just found that to be really challenging and the whole time I was there we never had any pictures by Native American artists so it was it was hard. And that's just one example. I'm going to jump out there and I just realized that the sun has been shining on my face so I hope you all can see me but at any rate I'm going to jump out there because yes, we do have objects in our collection that are racially charged um, or objects that carry a bit of, I don't know, energy around them. Uh, I won't talk about those. It's actually, as you were talking, as you asked the question, I was thinking more about the people and our visitors and our patrons of the gallery. 
And so I could give you two examples of, of that. And I remember at that time, I think it was 2016, and I had uh, an employee that worked in the gallery who was not a person of color. And it was probably her third day on the job. And we had a patron come into the gallery and was excited about the exhibition and had a bunch of questions. And, the, and she could not answer those questions. So she would say, we have to talk to the director. And so I came out of my office and I tried to talk to her and this person would not look at me and would only ask her questions. And so I use it as an example uh, to talk about, you know, not necessarily the objects, but sometimes the people that make those spaces uncomfortable. And then the other example that would be, even though we do have objects, uh, shackles and things of that nature, but it also makes me think about a tour that we had that came to campus. And at the end of the tour, the person asked me, said, you know what, I actually came here, first because at HBCU, right? I said, yes, it was founded six months after the Civil War. I said, yes. He said, well, I actually came here to see, me, see the slave art. And I said, slave art? He's like, yeah, I want to see shackles. I want to see this. You know, so it's those kind of interactions that, um, that I would equate that experience to, not necessarily the objects. I wanted to um, share a work with everyone. The Tuskegee Legacy Museum owns this work. Let me make sure that I have shared my screen properly. Oh, goodness. You want to click the share screen button at the bottom, the green button. So I wanted to share this piece uh, by Edward Brackett. And can you hear me? Okay. Um, so this is so this is um, John Brown, the abolitionist. And um, it needs conservation, but I wanted to share with you that um, the fact that it has been painted. Uh, probably saved it. Um, I think I have a I have an idea that the students probably colored this, uh, changed the color of it, and um, you know because it was all white marble, uh, or I mean white plaster, and so um, you know there was a time when that was not acceptable at Tuskegee, something like this. We have a lot of things in storage where they have colored things that were white, black. And um, I think it is very interesting that they chose, they also did this one. Probably we did not know what this was until uh, a couple of years ago when I was reading about um, a marble copy of this, that a marble example of this that was done by uh, Edward Brackett that is at Tufts University. And um, so that's how we found out it was John Brown because I was reading it in the paper. And so, so I am positive that the students did not know uh, who John Brown was and, uh, you know, colored this and actually, I'm going to say again um, that it, it saved it, the save the sculpture, you know, from being harmed. And also, I wanted to tell you that uh, this business about hanging him and all of the things that Black people have been through in terms of police brutality and George Floyd and the kneeling on the neck and all, it, it just brings up all kinds of um, um, it brings up all kinds of um, sorrow 
in me when I when I when I personally when I have to deal with this piece. Uh, and I wanted to share that. Thanks. There's a question actually to Lestarsha. Um, how did you as a conservator get through the experience of conserving a KKK banner? Um, that was something that I had to learn as I was doing it. I wasn't prepared for the amount of my work that was gonna come home with me. Um, so I had to sort of make it extra time at the end of the day to make sure that I leave that piece at work and that I gave myself enough time for self-care in dealing with that piece. Cause I know that I cannot tell my history and the history of my family without that sort of information and without those sort of objects, but I still wasn't fully prepared with how much emotional charge that would create for me. So there was a lot of um, making sure that I had my cup of tea at the end of the day and being sure that I had someone else review what I thought was correct for conservation to make sure that my bias of its context and of its history wasn't impacting my conservation decisions. Can I ask a question? So I think that use of that word bias, and especially in this instance, is it's like I'm like thinking about it a lot. Like, is that bias? It's I mean, to me, I th I think about bias having to do with um, like an unfair kind of um, perspective or you know whatever, like something like that. And I'm like, but about a KKK whatever it was, robe, what was it? Some kind of, it wasn't a banner. Was it a banner? A banner. Um, I'm like, that's not really, I don't think of that as bias really. I mean, the KKK is a violent, horrible thing. And so I think, you know, any feelings like that are just, those are justified. I mean, I, I get it in a way what you mean, but I also want to kind of tease away from that word because I think we're using it a little too freely or something. And it's, that, that's a very specific thing, what bias means. And I don't think, I think as a black person that's hired to work on a KKK banner, that's, you know, I don't know, that's a lot. Like, it's a lot. I mean, I, you know, I hear you about trying to have self-care, but I don't think having really strong negative feelings about that would mean that you are biased, really. I, I don't see it like that. Like I'm not interpreting that word like that, but I do think it's a, I think it is an emotional charge, of course, but I don't see, I think bias means something else to me. Um, so I just was thinking about that more because I think that's a lot, like that's real heavy. Like you went in with that and I'm like, dang, I, don't, I haven't had that experience. I've had some, some, some real charged things, but not that. I mean, they happen to me in a different way as a, as a curator. Um, and there definitely have been some, some stuff that's happened where I've been very like, oh, I can't believe I even participated in things where I later, I'm embarrassed, you know, years later where I'm like, I, I shouldn't have done it. I should have, I feel like I should have excused myself from that um, instance. And other people like, oh, you had to do it. I mean, it's happened to me in so many ways working in these white museum spaces. Um, I've been compelled to do things and later really felt bad about it. But um, not, not this, like this thing that you did, I feel like that is very hard to do and to be the person that's gonna spend that time, that kind of careful care of an object so, so long with something. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy duty to me. We're actually getting a lot of questions about Lestarsha's project and maybe we can kind of pose it to all the panelists of how would we approach a treatment such as this? Like how would we start? How could we assign this to someone? Is there a discussion that we can have kind of like a pre-discussion of before starting treatment, before even looking at the object, what can be done? I think in my case specifically, um, my supervisors were very upfront about what the project was going to be. And I was given the option to walk away at any point. Um, 
whether that meant I left doing that treatment entirely and that was gonna be up to my supervisors or if that meant I can't work on it today or this week. Um, and it was something that was shared between the four of us. So it was myself, my co-intern and then my two supervisors. So that way, if one of us needed to take a break from it, there were still people completing the work. So that way it could get through the conservation process as quickly and as safely as possible. So that way it wasn't something that we were constantly exposed to. And it could be put back into storage where it was covered and had its appropriate labelings on it. So that way people knew before they opened the box what they were going to be seeing. So that way if that was something that they had not prepared themselves for, then they can just move the box along to whatever process it needed to be moved to without having to be directly exposed to that object. So I think it's just a lot of forethought and care and making sure that if someone says, I, I can't do that right now, or I can't do that at all, that you're prepared to have someone else step in or step in yourself. I think that's such a, um, that's a good thing that you had that experience with folks where they, they, they did that and, um, I mean, I've been in a case where it wasn't conservation necessarily, it was about collections and about bringing in some material that was uh, definitely racist kind of imagery and objects. And it wasn't any care. It was kind of like, this is just what we're doing today. And I was, of course, the only black person, only person of color in the space um, as usual. And I was like, whoa, Did, had no idea that I was walking into that experience that day and just wasn't up for it to tell you the truth and um it wasn't that wasn't the case with anybody it was kind of like I just had a problem you know if I didn't want to participate in this activity because that was the activity for the day and there wasn't any allowance for this is not something I could do today or I would have liked to have had a had a heads up on that this was going to occur um there wasn't that. So I think it's special. And I think that's a good thing. That's for like a better kind of practice for like, you know, having an ethical code for how to handle these materials, knowing maybe what we're handling, when we're going to do it, why we're doing it, that kind of thing. Um, but that's not been my experience, unfortunately. I would like to ask Lestarcia, um, have you had moments when you are alone where you revisit the that con the conservation of the of that item I mean where it comes to you and um, if you have I, that's pretty serious that's some serious stuff yeah I think about that object um, specifically when I talk to my older family members so I a lot of my family does come from rural Texas and that's where um, I was born and raised so a lot of my elderly family members have had direct contact with the clan in their, in their histories or in their parents' histories. So to me, that piece comes up during those conversations. And we have had discussions about like, I have participated in the preservation of this. And the reaction from them has been varied. Some felt that my work was something that shouldn't have been done, that I should have allowed that piece to sort of rot in a corner and then some feel like you can't tell the full black experience in America without having the physical evidence of the Klan and everything that the Klan had done. Um, so at this point I don't really think about the piece unless we are having those conversations but I have thankfully been able to take away pieces that have very positive um, contacts and positive histories um, home with me from that museum and get to think about those and see them in video and on the website and think about those good, those good things and that's good history that comes from it. Thank you. I'm just gonna make a quick comment. I'm really happy that um, you had the support while you were working on uh, conserving the object. And, and to that point, I, I think that I believe that we can't work in a silo, especially when we're confronting charged material. And so I guess to answer the question in a sense, I think that when we think about exhibitions that may have charged material in them, we try to bring in uh, focus groups 
And so even with your, like you had for this particular instance, uh, you all, you, the director, you all were able to discuss it. And so I think you tackle those problems by bringing in more voices uh, to handle it. So in different perspectives. I'd like to uh, bring up something that uh, has happened in the news recently um, at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Uh, there was, and for those who do not know, um, they were seeking a new director and the description just um, has quoted uh, to maintain a core white art audience. Um, and Kelly Morgan, who was initially hired to diversify the museums and galleries, resigned in July and she wrote an op-ed piece calling the museum culture toxic, um, mainly because of lack of training efforts to address racis, uh, racism and implicit bias. So this is a really clear example of a museum's blanket efforts and um, how can we as museum professionals call for action? In other words, what does this example highlight in terms of actionable items that we can do from this example? And I'm actually gonna direct the um, question first to Latanya. I know that on social media, you've been vocal about this. So um, if you wanna take this question on. Um, thanks, Anita. You know, I think what's been interesting to watch out with, to watch what's been playing out or what did play out, hopefully there's gonna be a lot more because we do know the director of that institution resigned, um, but it was really only after there was significant external pressure, like about 2000 people signed a petition calling on the institution to um, that he should be fired or he should be forced to resign. But they had several other points in there. And right now, none of those other things are really, um, there's no kind of news on if those things will be done, the other things that they called for. And it's really so important to think about the larger issues, uh, the structural dimensions that allow for that director to be in place in the first place. So um, removing him is significant and it's a big, a huge thing because um, most of the time nothing happens at these places. But why it happened is because it went public and because they got a lot of external pressure. Now, Kelly had already wrote an article, has said all kinds of things, um, but she didn't get that kind of outpouring of support actually and other people have, have come out too and talked about things and they do not get that kind of support. They get you know certain things and somebody will write to you personally, but they're not getting that kind of collective support. So for real, for changing any institution, for real people have to work together a lot more. Um, museums and a lot of other spaces, but museums definitely are kind of retaliatory in terms of who is in power and people do not like to be questioned. And so um, a lot of times you see staff <clears throat> very afraid to speak out. And the only power I think that people have in these places is by speaking out and doing it more collectively. I mean, you could do it as an individual, but like Kelly said, it's really hard to do it by yourself. So working collectively is um, probably the, 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 the main thing we have for getting change done, but it's still so hard because like 2000 people signing this letter and then they did one thing. And then the rest is like, well, we'll see. And I think that this is what happens at institutions that have been brought in the, you know, have had the spotlight on them. And if it's really, really bad, they'll get rid of one highly problematic person who's probably just done all kinds of stuff. But then all the other things stay in place. And we're not really looking at what are the conditions that allowed that person to be there in the first place. Those, if those conditions don't change, of course, the, the culture remains the same at the place overall. It was interesting that you talk about the culture. And I'm gonna use one of my students as an example. Um, this year in this past cohort, uh, which was virtual, 
uh, we combined the second and third one uh, due to COVID. And at any rate, uh, one of the members from the second cohort who had met with probably 200 museum professionals, and at this particular instant had been meeting with about 25. Uh, after the call, she talked about how you can feel an inclusive environment when you either walk into the space or you log online. And so when we think about inclusivity, it's also about trans the, 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 it's also about being transparent. So I want to put that in one bucket. The other bucket that I think is really important to note, so the institution needs to be become more transparent, the board needs to be more transparent. But the other thing that I, that I think Latani, you just hit on just a little bit is that you can't let it rest. And so when we talk about advocacy, those 2000 people that signed that letter, that's power. But it just wasn't 2000 people from outside the community, it was also people from inside the community and also board members. And that's where you see swift change. But the gaps in between that, are periods where we stop talking. And so earlier today, somebody in the chat talked about how can, you know, we're talking about this curatorially and not about museum, I mean, not about conservation science. And when I saw that, I'm thinking the same thing I'm thinking now is that you can't sit on the sidelines. You can't sit there and focus in one area and say, oh, well, I'm just a conservator or I'm just a curator or I'm just a museum educator. You have to step out and be an advocate and ban the, you know, and 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 to to say that this is not right and this is what we could be. Now going back to the other side about transparency, that's about empowerment. So when you look at the director uh, and the, you can tell that he worked in a silo or not the institution is working in a silo by using the language that was used. And so, uh, so I just want to put that out there. Um, it's a, you know. The more and more I look at that institution, the more and more I think about what that institution may need and they need a healer. And so I hope uh, that a healer comes in to bring that community back together because what's beautiful about this moment is that people are engaged in the conversation. So they want to see a better future for their institution. And that's the part that I find most interesting and most beautiful. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel a question from our pre-submitted questions um, that I found pretty intriguing, but based on your own experience, what is the first mistake that we make as conservatives? I'd like to um, share uh, experience to someone that I ended up learning about through um, a curate, a, a conservator um, in University of Delaware who had been asked to conserve an object <clears throat> that it was given to the community, um, like a public sculpture. And so she went to work on it. I can't remember the whole story, so I might be getting it a little wrong, but this is basically the story. So it was a public sculpture, it was put outside and when the rain, you know, under the conditions of rain and so forth, it ended up becoming damaged. Now the materials that it was made out of actually weren't made to be outside in the first place. I don't remember what it was made out of, but it wasn't actually made to be outside. And um, it was an object that was given to the, a nearby neighborhood, which is a black neighborhood near University of Delaware. And people saw it as really, <coughs> excuse me, as an affront and kind of like a continuance of the university um, not connecting and not caring about the black community, giving them the sculpture that ended up falling apart soon after being put outdoors. And, but when the conservator um, was hired to work on the piece, it was kind of like, this is the piece and you're, you know, to conserve it and bring it back as much as possible. I'm probably getting the language kind of wrong. So please forgive me on that. But anyway, what she learned is that the community didn't want the object in the first place. And they were like, we really wish somebody would ask us about what we want. We don't care about you conserving that object. Um, we don't even want that object. And then it became an entirely different project that she took on that became about, you know, being in conversation with the community more and finding out what they would want and then working with them to create something. It ended up becoming a walking tour 
that they created and it was a whole the whole thing and i just thought it was a really interesting project to kind of witness i wasn't part of it i just kind of learned about it and went to some of the the public forums about it but this kind of thing when whoever makes a decision for other people about what we're giving them and what should be conserved who gets to make that decision in the first place for communities so that was a long way to get to it but that was something i thought was really interesting Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I feel in conservation, we often put ourselves in the roles of expert and teacher, and not so much in the roles of student and learner in terms of coming in contact with communities and what their desires are in terms of conservation. I think it's so important, like what you were just saying, and I think it ties to what Jamal was bringing up a little earlier about the healer thing. I think, um, and just so many people in the community had kind of came forth directly who live in Indianapolis, right? And then also this broader um, community. I think many more of us actually need to be in dialogue about things um, and really thinking with people and talking with people versus you know, like you said, Latarsha, thinking that we're the expert in speaking for communities. You know, I agree. I mean, I think one of the things, I guess that one of the biggest thing, problems that people make, and not just conservatives, but people in general, is that we make assumptions. And so anytime, you know, I think that we're in a position to make an assumption, how about ask a question? as to what you, you just uh, did, so. So we're hitting 5.30, we're a little bit over. And there's so many questions happening in the chat and so much discussion happening in the chat. I think we can gather some of these questions and send them to the panelists, um, but I'm gonna, uh, put it over to Sarah for closing remarks. Thank you all so much um, for your presentations and your discussion and your contribution today. Um, I just wanted to let all of our participants know that the recordings of all of the webinars from the Social Justice and Conservation series are um, accessible on AIC's YouTube channel. And you can also view them um, through the webinar portals on our website. And if you go to those portals on our website, you'll also see additional um, resources on each of the webinar topics there. So those resource guides were just added today. Um, so if you were registered for the previous webinars or if you wanna go back to the portal from today, um, you'll find resource guides that list a bunch of articles and other places to look for further information on these topics. We'll also be sending out a brief survey to gather feedback on this series. And we'd really appreciate um, your participation so that when we do future programming like this, we can um, improve next time. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Um, again, keep an eye out for an email coming with the link to the recording so you can share that with your colleagues. And um, we hope to see you soon.